All right, so last time we talked about fixed first law. Today I want to introduce what is called the diffusion convection equation, which is probably the most important tool you'll be using in this class and sort of understanding uh, one, how to use it, and two, sort of where it comes from without going into the, the nitty gritty so much. So today's goal is be able to use the diffusion convection equation for transport phenomena. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is what really is diffusion, and we sort of hinted at it uh, with the fixed first law derivation. So if you have some dye, and you drop the dye into the water, what you'll see is a dispersion of particles throughout the solution until there's some sort of homogeneity. So this goes from uh, clear water, then the dye comes in, then the dye spreads out until it's pretty much uniformly mixed all the way throughout, and you get the same shade of purple throughout the entire beaker. Okay, but when this dispersal dispersion pattern happens uh, it pretty much happens symmetrically so you could see this sort of looks spherical so you expect that the the dye particles are moving out sort of in spherical shells throughout the solution uh, what I'm sort of trying to get at is that diffusion is a randomly driven process and it proceeds from high concentration to low concentration so here we have high concentration and the molecules that are at high concentration spread out until they get uh, to regions of low concentration. It's a microscopic process and is driven by, again, randomness. So we talked about last time in deriving fixed first law was that one-dimensional random walk. Well, this sort of takes you into looking at what a three-dimensional random walk sort of looks like, where the dye is spreading out um, in, in a bunch of directions. And again, it's because once the, the dye is all located here, it's far more likely for the particles to move outward than it is to move inward. So they all start to randomly move outward until the randomness has equaled uh, this. And the reason it looks homogeneous is because once the, all the particles have uh, dispersed all the way throughout the solution, uh, there's, there's no more propensity for it to move one way or another. So they're all just going to pretty much move and cancel each other out. So what you get is just homogeneous uh, distribution of particles. Okay, so let's talk about something that's a little bit different, and that is what people usually uh, see when, when we talk about heat transfer. So what we're talking about is convection. So this is where you get currents of, of movement throughout your, I guess, solution. In this case, you have the, the heat supplying um, well, the fire supplying heat at the bottom of this beaker. So you have pockets of warm water moving upward and pockets of cool water moving downward. And this is because the density changes with the temperature. So as the density changes, this moves up. Then once it gets cold, it moves back down. And you get these pockets of circulating currents. And that's what we typically associate with convection. But the correct way to describe it is the word advection. So advection is uh, sort of spreading out of particles that's associated with a bulk process, so bulk movement. You have a current, uh, which is a basically a, a, a big velocity profile of things moving, and that's what we call a bulk process, because the liquid is moving in bulk uh, when we talk about advection. Convection is generally what we talk about when we combine the effects of diffusion and advection. So not only do you have the bulk movement of the current, of the molecules in the current moving this way, but they're also dispersing out uh, with the, the randomness that's associated with diffusion. Even here, when the dye is being dropped into the water, you sort of see a little bit of advection occurring, right? Because uh, when this, this drop of dye enters the water, it has some amount of downward velocity. So that's bulk movement. You can see that here, most of the dye is moving downward, and that's because it has bulk velocity from gravity coming down into this and you don't see so much dye uh, up here because again it came with a downward velocity so most of the particles are going to be spreading out in this direction if we had a drop of dye magically suspended here then you would see like perfectly I guess symmetric diffusion happening at the center of this beaker but because we had the input velocity what we're going to get is advection with diffusion which leads to a convection sort of pattern okay so why does this matter? Well, let's talk a little bit about, I guess, conservation laws and why we, how and why we're trying to model them. So what is transport phenomena all about? Well, let's, let's try a metaphor. So say that you're on some sort of magical island with oranges. 
okay? So, again, problem statement, you're on an island with orange trees, and the trees generate oranges, right? The oranges grow on the trees, you get more oranges that way. So these trees generated five oranges. And if you have birds, then the birds can consume the oranges. So that lowers your overall orange count, right? If we had a bird here, you could be eating that orange, and a bird here eating that orange, then you had five oranges generated and two consumed. So right now you have three oranges left. Well, sometimes suppose you also ship oranges out from your island, and sometimes people ship oranges to you. So then you have an additional uh, source of oranges. So the oranges are perhaps coming on this boat. Let me draw an arrow here. So here they're coming in, here they're coming out. Let's say you take one of these oranges and there that one's coming out, but over here in this boat people are shipping you two oranges. So now you have a more complicated uh, balance. You're only generating four oranges, right? Uh, two of them are being consumed, one is now moving out of the island, and two are moving into the island. And let's say you're consumed with or concerned with the amount of oranges that are on your island at any given time. What we're really getting at is your general conservation law. And we're considering that law in this volume, so on this island. For a conservation law that we're considering, we always need a volume. In that case, that's the island. Uh, generation comes from reactions. So say you have a reaction that generates a product, and that product is the one that you're doing the conservation law on. Then the product is being generated. Say you're doing the balance on a reactant, the that reactant is being consumed but not generated. So you're losing it to consumption, but maybe you also have a stream of that reactant coming into the system, or a stream of oranges coming into the system. Okay, so we're concerned about how each of these terms affects the overall balance of what we have in our system. Um, the transformation of this equation in general gives us the following mathematical expression, which is we are going to call the diffusion convection equation. And I'm going to explain the variables that we have in here uh, now. So the dc dt is what we associate with our accumulation. It's how much concentration of your species is present over time or how much oranges are present on the island. This del dot n is what we associate with in influxes or outfluxes. That's the shipping that's happening either out of the island or into the island. I'll explain a little bit of the math later. Don't, don't get too afraid that there's a vector calculus in there. And the reaction is what we associate with the generation or consumption, whatever species that we're interested in, in looking at. So what's important to, to notice here is that this confusion dif well, diffusion uh, convection equation is what we call a scalar equation, right? So concentration doesn't have a direction. And time doesn't have direction. So over here, concentration per time is what we call a scalar. It is a quantity that has a value but no direction. Uh, reaction. So reaction is typically also going to be in concentration per time. So reaction does not have a direction. You can't have a positive reaction or a negative reaction because your reaction doesn't really have direction. You could have consumption or generation, but that talks about the magnitude of the terms that are included within reaction. Over here, we have something that's called a divergence. Notice that your um, del is a vector, that's what this little arrow is, and your n, which I'm going to tell you is your flux later, is also a vector. Well, the divergence of this is a scalar. So the divergence of flux, which is what we denote here, del dot anything is that divergence. Um, it is a scalar, and this uh, scalar in particular measures how much convection or mass transport plays a role, and either as a source or as a sink. If it's going to be a positive contribution, if you're going to get more oranges, it's going to be a positive divergence or a source of oranges. If it's negative, it's going to be a sink or a net loss of oranges here. So 
let's talk a little bit more about uh, divergence so we get comfortable with this idea and we aren't scared of, of the mathematics behind there. So divergence again is a measure of sources or sinks within a vector field. So if you have a vector field, if the points, if the vectors are going uh, outward from a point that is a positive divergence because you again the, the lines are diverging and if they're pointing inward that is a sink or a negative divergence. The easiest way I like to think about it is if you think about running water. So here we have um, a literal sink setup. I'm going to try to move this over so everything fits. Um, at the faucet you have water coming out. So this is a source. All the vectors are going to be moving outward from this point. And over here you have a sink. So all the the vectors for the flow of the water are going to be even into this point where you're losing the water, so that is a sink. An inward flux and an outward flux. Overall, if this is our control volume, we want to look at if we have more source or more sink, or if they actually uh, equal each other and cancel each other out. So let's look a little bit more closely at the mathematics there then. And examine this diffusion uh, convection equation. So again, this is the general form of the equation. As we investigated last time, J is what we call the diffusive flux. And that's what we found when we were doing fixed first law and we were doing uh, diffusion through the, the thin film. And we describe that as negative D, DC, DZ, and that's one dimensional fixed first law. If we're going to make it three dimensional, if we're going to generalize it, I talked a little bit about this last time, we are simply going to replace the DDZ with the gradient. The gradient of a scalar field is going to be a vector. Okay? So what this is really measuring is how much the concentration changes in space due to the microscopic influence of, well, diffusion. And diffusivity is controlling um, the, the weight. If you have a low diffusivity, then you're going to have a low diffusive flux. If you're going to have a high diffusivity, you're going to have a high diffusive flux. So the, the magnitude of this is really dependent upon this constant D, which changes uh, for the material that you're observing the diffusion for. So as I said before, the gradient, which is this operation you see here, um, del applied to C, the gradient of a scalar field is a vector, and it is the vector that points in the greatest direction of increase. Okay? But if you remember, when we're talking about diffusion, we're talking about the movement of molecules from a place of high concentration to a place of low concentration. So, in general, we want our diffusive flux to be positive, and the gradient of a scalar field points in the direction of greatest increase. So this is pointing from low to high. The reason that we have this negative in here is that we want the point from high to low. So this negative sign is really reversing the sign of our gradient so that our diffusive flux points in the direction that we commonly associate uh, diffusion with. So again, this points from low to high, this negative sign flips it around, so it's pointing from high to low, which is the direction of our diffusive flux. Okay, so the other term that we were talking about earlier is advective flux. So again, advective flux is the movement of molecules that's associated with bulk motion. So these currents here are what we call bulk motion. Again, diffusive flux associated with randomness, random walks in this diffusivity constant. Advective flux is dependent upon the movement of the bulk of molecules. What we call N and what you see in the diffusion convection equation is total flux. It is the combination of the diffusive flux and the advective flux, which again, earlier we called convection. So again, the total flux or the convective flux is equal to the diffusive flux plus, plus the advective flux. Uh, we could more easily describe it as the diffusive flux plus CV, which is the advective flux. Uh, we're going to talk about different ways you could describe this term later on in the course. You can use um, the fluxes of particular species when the mixture, or we'll, we'll worry about that later. So, taking this over here. Whoops. So moving this down, 
And now that we have a definition for our total flux, we could expand it, the diffusion convection equation, by putting that relationship in here. So now we have del dot diffusive flux plus advective flux. See that both of these needed to be vectors, right? Because they're still going to be in a divergence sort of scenario. So and remember the divergence of this is going to be a scalar because this is overall a scalar equation. Okay, so the next thing that we can do is we can take the fixed first law that we came up with before and substitute that in here as well. So we know that J is related to uh, diffusivity and the gradient of a scalar field of concentration. So we make that substitution and now we have this. So now it's looking even more and more complicated. What I want you to do is not focus so much on the mathematical expression, but what each of the terms mean. Again, this is accumulation, this is your in minus out, and this is your generation and your consumption due to reaction. Your in minus out consists of both advective flux over here and diffusive flux. And you need to take the divergence, because again, this entire equation is a scalar equation. You're looking for sources and sinks of your, your species. Uh, the last thing that we could say is that we could involve kinetics a little bit and say this reaction term, um, we could sub in a rate law. So a rate law um, is always expressed as a rate constant times concentration to a certain order. If it's say a first order reaction, then we call the reaction rate k times c to the one. If it's the second order reaction, it's k times c to the two. So overall, the most complicated form that you could see for your diffusion convection equation is going to look like this. So here accumulation, here in minus out, and here this is um, generation or consumption. And you could have different looking rate laws in here as well, but we'll just call it, call it a day and use a simple one like this. So we could see here, or what the most important thing you, I'm trying to get you to see is that uh, this generally contains um, derivatives with respect to the coordinate system that you're working in. And most general, you're going to be using a three-dimensional coordinate system. That could be x, y, z, that could be spherical coordinates, that could be cylindrical coordinates. Over here, you have the introduction of a time variable over here. Uh, so overall, this diffusion convection equation is a partial differential equation. So it's not trivial to solve. Just like you might have dealt with Navier-Stokes in your uh, transport one sequence, being pretty difficult to solve, the diffusion convection equation is equivalently very difficult to solve. Uh, that's why as the most important part of the course of modeling transport phenomena, which is mostly what you're going to be doing, is you need to pick apart the assumptions that you need to make to simplify the diffusion convection equation. So the course overall is about modeling in terms of simplifying a partial differential equation so that you could solve it for the concentration profile of a situation and the flux profile for a situation. So again, to, to I guess hit that home, let's look once again at the problem we solved last time, the thin film diffusion problem. Because we already know the solution, um, let's see if we could arrive there using the diffusion convection equation. So let's start at the top. Our diffusion and convection equation looks like this, where again we have the accumulation here, the in minus out over here, and the reaction right there. So just like last time, the first thing we assumed was within our thin film, we had no reaction occurring. So we could zero out that reaction term on the right hand side. The other thing we know is that we're going to assume that our thin film diffusion example has uh, steady state modeling there. So we don't have a DCDT that's simply going to be zero. What we now get is the divergence of the total flux is going to be equal to zero. All right, so there's two ways of sort of looking at this. Um, the first way is the, the very nitty gritty math that we, we get into. That's what I'm gonna go through first, uh, but from there on out, we're pretty much going to model them as one dimensional diffusion examples every time. So this is pretty much the last time I'm going to do this. Super, super complicated. You'll see why. So, what we want to say is we want to say that the total flux is going to be one dimensional. So we can express, this, express the diffusion in this way. 
This takes a little bit of justification, so I'm going to put it out to the side right now. First of all, this del in Cartesian, or what we call rectilinear coordinates, looks like this. It's a vector that contains a ddx component, a ddy component, a ddz component. So you have a derivative with respect to each of the coordinate directions. And these unit vectors are just um, typical ones you use for a three-dimensional coordinate system. So if you have this going on here, you're going to have i, j, and k directions. So these are unit vectors. You can also use the <coughs> angular bracket notation to just say d, dx, comma, d, dy, comma, d, d, z, comma. I'm going to use this notation because more people seem to be familiar with it. The other thing we want to say is we want to assume that our total flux is going to be one dimensional. So it's only going to be in the k hat or z direction. Okay, so then what we can do now, we have expressions for both our, I guess, del vector and our total flux vector is we can, I guess, uh, do the dot product. And what the dot product gets us is this, right? So you take each of the components and you multiply them and then you add them. So since there is no um, i hat or x dependence to the flux, pretty much you're going to be multiplying that term by zero. Over here, you're going to be multiplying by that by zero. So it's going to be this times this. So the derivative of zero is zero. The derivative of zero is again zero. And dz of n in the k hat direction is simply going to be this here. Since it's all going to be one dimensional, then we could sort of <coughs> forget about the vector momentarily. Okay, so what happens next? We know that the total flux can be modeled as the diffusive flux plus the advective flux. What we're going to assume right now is that there is no advection in the system. So again, it's just randomly driven movement of one, mole, one mole high concentration gradient to low concentration gradient. There's no velocity forcing this uh, convection to happen. That's why we're zeroing this out here. Now we could again say that we're going to use fixed first law. And this del, again, we introduce for rectangular coordinates. And we're going to say it's for or being applied to a uh, concentration scalar field. So at each position, you're going to have some change in concentration as it depends upon the coordinates of the system. Once again, like before, since we said the flux is only happening in the z direction, we're going to say that this gradient is only going to depend upon the k direction, or the k hat direction, or also known as the z direction. What it allows us to do is it allows us to simplify total flux by writing it as equal to the diffusive flux, and then saying that that diffusive flux is simply going to be this. Remember, at this point in time, we still have vector total flux, and this is still a vector. But we know that since it's a one-dimensional scenario, we could remove the vector notation, because again, um, for a one-dimensional vector, it's simply you don't have to do any conversion for the, for the actual length. So it's going to be the components of it divided by the square root of the magnitude, well, the component squared, which will simply just give you this. Right, if you have something moving along a one-dimensional line or a road at five meters per second, you can simply re represent that as oh, just five meters meters per second as a magnitude instead of a direction as well. Okay, so once we've done that, that allows us to do is up here we're able to sub in n since we now have n as a scalar not n as a vector. So plugging that into there, we now have the divergence is going to be equal to negative ddz of what was once in there as a diffusive flux. OK. It's getting pretty complicated, but now you'll see it gets much less complicated. So before, because we said it was steady state, we said we had no reaction, the divergence is going to be equal to 0 which means that 
over here, this expression that we came up with is also going to be equal to zero. So we can get rid of these negative signs, they cancel each other out anyway, become positive. And then by general integration, we know that if this derivative is zero, then whatever is inside must be equal to a constant. And this is pretty close to what we were looking at before, the thin film diffusion example, that with the boundary conditions, look at the final concentration profile to look like this, which is identical to what we came up with using the assumptions that we did last time. So from now on, when we're modeling um, these transport problems, we're going to be using the diffusion convection equation because it contains all the terms that we could possibly care about. And we could use our assumptions um, when, when framing the problem or modeling the problem to simplify from there. Uh, where you'll generally see the most shortcutting happens here when you're actually looking at the divergence. If you know your problem is going to be one dimensional, which in our case is pretty much always going to be the case, you'll see oftentimes is skipping directly to this line here. We're skipping even directly to this line over here. And then simply substituting in fixed first law to give that. Instead of going through this whole mess over here. Um, as much as possible, we're going to try avoiding complicated mathematical expressions by assuming everything is one dimensional. Maybe if you go to grad school, you'll actually model some problems that have two dimensional or three dimensional flux without symmetry. All right, so hopefully you had some intuition for how we're moving from this generalized mass balance to the diffusion uh, convection equation, what diffusion is, what convection is, what advection is, and how they all play a role, maybe what divergence is as well, so you're not afraid of the mathematics that you see in the diffusion convection equation. And hopefully you see the parallels between what we did in the thin film diffusion with the generalized mass balance and what we did here with uh, the diffusion convection equation.